Thank you for joining us for our Ask the Expert series for adults living with hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. I am delighted to be here today at Johns Hopkins Hospital with Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist here at Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon, and they are both with the Cerebral Fluid Center for CSF Disorders. So thank you both for joining us. Happy to be here. Pleasure Great. to be here. Thank you. So let's talk NPH. Um, we have a number of individuals in our community living with normal pressure hydrocephalus. And I think, let's start at the very beginning. How do people who are suspected of having normal pressure hydrocephalus find you? So what, what symptoms are they typically seeing and, and how do they get to you to seek a uh, diagnosis? Often uh, these patients start having problems with their gait. They, they start falling, they lose their balance. Uh, this prompts a visit to their primary care physician who may refer them to a neurologist or do some basic tests first. Um, often that involves getting a scan of their brain, and uh, it's often that scan, whether it's a CAT scan or an MRI, that shows excess cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, or what we call as hydrocephalus, and that often initiates a referral to the neurosurgeon or to a neurologist to further evaluate this condition. So it can start off with balance problems if it goes undetected or untreated for a while, it can also cause cognitive problems like memory problems, and in some people also cause problems with controlling their bladder. So I think one of the things that we hear a lot out in the community is the high rate of misdiagnosis, that people go to see a doctor, uh, maybe even get referred to a neurologist, they're diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's early on, so there seems to be a lot of overlap then in symptoms with some of the other dementias that are out there. So at that point, um, if somebody really suspects that they've been misdiagnosed, or maybe, gosh, they don't even suspect it, you know, what, what do you recommend for them uh, to look for to make sure that they are getting to the right doctor or getting the right diagnosis? Uh, these symptoms, as you just mentioned, are fairly common as we get older, unfortunately. And they are often symptoms of other disorders, like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And those are far more common, and those often come to the mind of the physicians first, and often uh, that's where the decision-making stops. But one has to remember that these symptoms are nonspecific, means they don't imply a certain diagnosis. It's the constellation of symptoms together with findings of increased cerebrospinal fluid on imaging that should definitely raise the suspicion of this alternative condition that is often misdiagnosed, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, so if you have two or three of these symptoms, balance problems, cognition, controlling bladder, and you have increased cerebrospinal fluid on your scans, that should at least prompt a referral for further assessment of normal pressure hydrocephalus. And that's best done at centers that do this more often. Okay. You know, uh, Dr. Mogakar mentioned this process of getting the symptoms and then the image is often what triggers the, the hydrocephalus uh, concern and referral. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that could be a matter of some months, but sometimes we've seen it as a matter of years. Uh, and this with this issue of either not recognizing it or other diagnoses coming in. And so uh, it, it, is, it is important for uh, general practitioners, geriat geriatric neurologists to keep in mind the possibility of, of hydrocephalus and the CSF disorder, and perhaps uh, if the patient feels that there's a, you know, that there's something that's not being diagnosed, ask if, if there's an image that may be planned, because the image really becomes the, the, the gateway to the possibility of ruling out. It may be that the image shows no hydrocephalus problem, and it's correct to look down these other directions. If it shows a reasonable collection of fluid, then the hydrocephalus should be kept in mind. So somewhere in this process, and hopefully it doesn't, wouldn't, you know, would not take years, uh, an image uh, should be obtained. So just for the individuals watching today who might not have a diagnosis yet of normal pressure hydrocephalus, but where they might not feel in their gut that the diagnosis that their loved one's been given is the right one, what I hear is we should, everybody should keep in mind the triad of symptoms that are typically associated with normal pressure hydrocephalus, and that would be gait, and that then translates to problems walking, cognitive issues, which could look like memory or having trouble making decisions or doing normal tasks, and then urinary urgency or incontinence, so where somebody 
um, potentially starts to have trouble holding their urine or maybe even wetting themselves a little bit. And then you say that that would be a great time for somebody to say to their doctor, could we get an MRI or a CAT scan to see if this could be something more? Um, and from there, and just turning back to what you mentioned, that it's the gateway, where do referrals for your center typically, like where are the majority of referrals made from your center? Initially, I would think it would be a primary care doctor who would say, you know, I think you really should go to Johns Hopkins and see Dr. Mogakar, Dr. Luciano, I suspect this is MPH, but are primary care doctors the primary referrals for your center? I believe by and large they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, the primary care physician also often gets the image sees even in the reading that there's a possibility of a hydrocephalus and that does the referral. So that, that is the, the largest group of referrals we get. Uh, you know, but obviously a neurologist uh, would be probably uh, the second major group and, and uh, really any, any primary or any other subspecialty who gets that image uh, and uh, has a reading of hydrocephalus could send us the referral. So on the image, they're going to see the enlarged ventricles and they're going to refer out to you. So then out of curiosity as well, because I know you two work very closely together in managing your patients, do you typically get them because they see enlarged ventricles on a scan and they say, oh, this is neurosurgery? Mm -hmm. You know, when they come into our system, they come into it really as a CSF disorder uh, in, in one system. And we try and see patients as, you know, expeditiously as possible. Uh, We'll, we'll give the neurologist, Dr. Bogokar, the, especially the ones that are more complex and have more <laughs> uh, differentiation from other issues. We, we differentiate them all we, you know, to find out which ones would be responsive to a shunt and which ones won't. But uh, in general, they come into us uh, as a center, and then we divide them up from there and sort okay. it out. Well, great. And then um, I'm assuming that there's a protocol that you both go through or individually in your own specialties to determine, to confirm the diagnosis, and then to determine what the best treatment plan. Are there certain uh, tests that you do to determine whether somebody is a candidate, if they do in fact have normal pressure hydrocephalus, and if they are a candidate for treatment? Sure. So all patients who get referred to us with this possible diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus undergo either a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture or an extended CSF drainage trial. And during the lumbar puncture, the goal is to drain at least 30 to 40 ml of cerebrospinal fluid. And we do a specific test of gait and cognition before and after the lumbar puncture. The goal is to see, is there a significant improvement in these parameters after you drain fluid? Whether it's 30 to 40 cc's after a spinal tap or much more fluid from an extended spinal fluid drainage procedure that can be done in the hospital. But the bottom line is what we are looking for is not small changes in gait, balance, or cognition, but significant improvement that would mean a different quality of life for the patient. So if we see that significant improvement after the spinal tap, that's when we determine that they are good candidates for shunt surgery, and that's when we refer them to Dr. Luciano. You know, one thing I think perhaps we should mention is it's important to really quantitate and then understand how much improvement really is significant versus how much is just random improvement. Uh, there may be uh, the opportunity in some places to have some fluid removed and people go back and say, yes, I think you've improved. And, and so they put a shunt in or not. And uh, what we find is you know, that's not quite enough. We need to know how much the improvement is because with, with the experience doing these, we have an idea, well, that's kind of random improvements. Whereas if you reach this threshold, we really think that the CSF removal helped. So wherever the test is done, it's, it's, it's good to have it done by people who are actually taking a close look. Mm -hmm. They're measuring, uh, they're figuring out how much the difference is and then deciding whether it's enough. So it's not just, you know, hmm. Mm -hmm. There's enough noise in the system in the sense, if you give the same test every day to a person who has hydrocephalus, they're gonna perform at different levels slightly. So what you wanna ensure is that whatever your cutoff or threshold for calling something improvement, that threshold is far above noise. So you're not doing shunt surgery based on random chance improvement. So I think so that, so that those of you watching understand as you're going through the diagnosis process, there is going to be a test where they will be uh, doing a lumbar puncture or an extended drain. And that really does require um, a needle 
which is being placed into the back, which is a very general term. That's not the medical term. It's actually going into the spinal fluid space in the spinal column, um, withdrawing fluid. So I know for some people who have called the Hydrocephalus Association for support, that does sound scary, but it really is the most effective way to determine if somebody is going to improve with treatment. Absolutely. And, okay. and a spinal tap sounds scary, but you know, we do do it under local anesthesia. And uh, one research study compared a spinal tap to an intravenous injection to an intramuscular injection. And surprisingly, the intramuscular injection hurt more. So it's more painful to get a flu shot than to get a spinal tap. Well, that's actually, I hope that makes some people feel better because I know it is scary to think about getting um, a spinal tap. And then I think the second important thing that I heard, but correct me if I'm wrong, for people to keep in mind, because it is so frustrating when you're trying to get a diagnosis for somebody that you love or for yourself, for it to take a long time. But it does sound like an initial spinal tap or initial fluid removal might not give the answer about whether or not it's time to treat right then and there. And you might have to wait a month, two months, three months before you make a decision to treat or whether or to understand whether that treatment is going to be beneficial? Is that what I heard or is that incorrect? So there, so there are two possibilities if you don't get better from a spinal tap. One is that it's unlikely you will benefit from a shunt because there's something else going on. So we always make a good effort to make sure that there is no other process going on that could explain why you did not get better after a spinal tap. Or the second possibility is, yes, you do have hydrocephalus, but you're not at a stage at which a shunt could help you, meaning your gait may not be very impaired for you to actually show an improvement. So sometimes, paradoxically, your gait may need to get worse before we can demonstrate a measurable improvement. And often these patients, we follow them closely every six months. And when we do see signs that they have progressed, we may opt to repeat the spinal tap. And I'm, I'm sure that they are scared and frustrated with that process, but I hope that this will help everyone understand who is going through it, that sometimes it's actually better to wait mm -hmm. and to be sure than to immediately treat. We really wish there was a, a quick blood test, you know, or a, a factor analysis that says this, this is the disease, but we, we really don't have uh, a way besides asking the question, you know, does a person improve with a trial fluid removal? And uh, it's, it's a very kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a trial. It's not a real test that just shows a marker. That's what a lot of research is working on, but there's still a great distance away before we find any marker. So unfortunately, this is where we are now, is we have to take some fluid, look closely, make sure there's no other, you know, other problems that are causing the, the common symptoms that we see, and that process can take time. So let's end today's segment with some advice for the two of you for individuals who are in the middle of the process of being diagnosed and, and maybe at that frustration point, which again, I, I understand can be very scary and frustrating, or people who suspect that it's not what their loved one has been diagnosed or they're seeing changes in their loved one and need to start the diagnosis process, advice from the two of you for them um, about how they should manage. You know, they should definitely advocate uh, for at least getting some kind of imaging study done because even if it's not hydrocephalus, there are many other things that can be picked up on a scan. Uh, but if you don't do that imaging study in the first place, uh, the possibility of hydrocephalus may not even be entertained by many physicians. So they need to be their own best advocates. And the second step would be to, once having that image and acknowledge that there is a possibility of hydrocephalus, is finding a neurosurgeon who has some experience with, with, uh, with shunting. And there are many out there. Uh, some of them are actually centered on pediatric neurosurgery and, and do many adults. But there are uh, many neurosurgeons that do that. But it is important to find a neurosurgeon that has experience with hydrocephalus and especially perhaps a neurosurgeon or team that has tested them in the way we talked about with some quantitative measures. So yes, advocate, bring up the word hydrocephalus because that may be enough of them to say, oh yeah, maybe we should get an image or an image and then act on that by finding someone. And I will add my advice, which is don't be scared to ask for a second opinion. It is your right to ask for a second opinion, and it's important. This is your own health or somebody that you love, and it is okay to seek another set of eyes um, as you're going through the diagnostic process. 
And the Hydrocephalus Association has a physician's directory, and we're also happy to help you find doctors who do know hydrocephalus and how to treat hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Never hesitate to reach out to us. And so with that, I want to thank everybody who submitted questions for our Ask the Expert series. And I'd like to thank Dr. Mogakar and Dr. Luciano for joining us today. And we will see you next time. Thanks.